Uh, okay, First Peter chapter 5. We're looking at verses 1 through 11 this morning, uh, and that will conclude our series on First Peter. Uh, yes, or that's a shame, I don't know. Um, a little too excited there. We're going to go through it again. Loop right back. Um, yeah, we're doing verses 1 through 11 this morning, 12 through 14, those very final verses of the book. Scott actually covered those in his introduction, you might remember, a number of months ago. Uh, so this will be our, our final time looking at 1 Peter together. So let's look at these verses. They say, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. <laughs> Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever Amen. I love the Bible. <laughs> I've loved going through this series in 1 Peter. I feel like I've just learned so much from it, been so encouraged by it. And one of the things that, that it's done for me is just wake me up to certain realities that I already knew, like God. He's real. He's real. He's a factor in my life. I'm living for him today. Okay, I'm awake to this. Salvation. What a glorious salvation that I have. I don't want to take this for granted. My identity, who I am in Christ. Holiness. I need to be living for holiness. I need to be pursuing holiness in my life. Witness. There's people all around me who are perishing. And it matters how I live before them. It matters how I preach the gospel to them. All of these kinds of things. Uh, this passage wakes us up to a, a few more realities. One of them is eternity. That Peter continues to give certain instructions and he says, none of these make any sense unless you know that you're living for eternity. The way that I'm telling you to live, the, way, the sacrifice that I'm asking you to make does not make any sense unless there's an eternal crown of glory laid up for you. One of the other realities that it wakes us up to is the devil. It's the final um, instruction that Peter gives in this entire book is I want you to know and remember and realize uh, that the devil is real. Um, and God wants to heighten our awareness to this and realize that there's a warfare that that puts us in. There's nothing more important for us as Christians than to realize that our faith is a warfare and we have to wake up to it and be aware of it. And so as I was preparing for this morning and thinking, how could I possibly cover all of the things that, uh, that Peter talks about in this section? Because there's just so much. I did feel led to focus on this final command that he gives of resist the devil. What does that mean? What does that look like? How do we do this effectively in our lives? And so that's where we'll focus most of our time this morning. And the first thing that we want to say is just simply that our enemy is real. The devil is real. Uh, just to give kind of a quick technical note here, uh, the Bible is absolutely clear on the devil being real. Uh, and beyond that, it also talks about a whole spiritual realm, the fact that there's demons, uh, the fact that there's a kingdom of darkness. Uh, and whereas God is omnipresent and all-powerful so he can interact with all of us um, at the same time, uh, the devil is not those things. He can't do that. Uh, and so the way that he seems to do multiple things at once is by the fact that there is this kingdom of darkness. 
Okay, so it's unlikely that the, that the devil himself is attacking any one of us. Uh, it's possible, but it's unlikely because we're just probably not that important. Um, but, uh, but there is enemy attack and that that's real. And so Peter just says this in shorthand. He's fine for us to have this understanding of the devil is going to attack you. And let's not split hairs about who that exactly is. We just need to be aware of this reality. So as we live our Christian lives to God, there is one who is waging war against us, the devil. Uh, he is real. Peter talks about him in absolutely realistic terms. Uh, this is someone who is just as real as your friends or your coworker or your spouse. That's hopefully the only point of similarity between the devil and your spouse. Uh, but it is a point of similarity. They are both real. And the fact that they're real and the fact that they interact with you has real implications for your life. And so Peter's saying, I want you to know that he's real. And this is important. It needs to be said because one of the enemy's main tactics, I believe, is to make us numb to this fact, just to make us think that he's actually not real after all, or that to talk about him puts, in a, puts us in a kind of super spiritual camp that we don't want to be. Uh, even as I was preparing, you know, like I said, at first I felt that this is the direction that I'm supposed to go. But as Sunday morning got closer and closer, I started to feel more and more insecure. Like, am I just diving off the deep end here into some kind of super spiritual thing? Uh, and I felt reminded over and over again of, no, I'm just preaching the Bible. This is what Peter says to us is that we have a real enemy. We need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of it because it is one of his tactics is to make us unaware of him. If he can, on the one hand, wage war against us, if he can attack us every day, and on the other hand, we're not even sure whether he exists, then we're going to be constantly taken off guard by him. We're going to be constantly unprepared for the battle that Peter wants us to be ready for and God wants us to be ready for. And so who is our enemy? Uh, he is the devil and he fights against us every, every day. The enemy wants to destroy your faith in the word of God. Uh, this is a sure foundation for us to build our lives on. And the enemy every day is invested in undermining your faith. And so he'll do it through circumstances, through philosophies, uh, through these kinds of things. I believe that he'll do it through Netflix. Netflix is not primarily a streaming service, I don't think. I think that it is um, a set of worldviews that are opposed to the gospel. Um, and that when we, when we watch, when we engage in these kind of things, we are hearing a doctrine of humanism, a doctrine of relativism, does sin really matter, all of these kinds of things. And we're hearing them through the most effective communication that there is, which is storytelling. Okay, and so what I'm simply saying here is, we just need to be aware that the enemy is real. We need to be aware of that. And we need to say, do I want to open myself up right now to hearing his lies? Is that something I want to do right now? Um, so I will leave that with you. <laughs> the enemy wants us to become hopelessly entangled in sin. So he will tempt us. This is what he did right from the beginning. The first time he comes on the scene, Genesis 3, what is he doing to Adam and Eve? He's tempting them. He's saying, what if not living according to God's commands was better than living according to his commands? What if that's actually a better way for you to go? Doesn't this thing here seem quite appealing? And this is one of the most helpful things I know for my life to get a hold of is that when there is a temptation to sin, when there's a temptation to not do what God has told me to do, that that is exactly the enemy's scheme in my life. That I've, if I give in to sin, there's more than just me and my own behavior. There's a whole spiritual realm that is real. Uh, and in that moment, I'm partnering with the devil. It's a really helpful insight for me because then I think, do I, wait, who am I? Do I want to partner with God or do I want to partner with the devil? All of a sudden, I have some new motivation, I have some new perspective for what I want to do. So the enemy will do these things. He'll, he wants us to become silent and ineffective. So he will intimidate us. He will try to grip us with fear. He'll try to blind us with pride. So even when good things happen, he's on hand to try and twist that round and make it into an unhelpful pride because he knows that pride comes before a fall. Again, he will just numb us to sleep if he can do that. If the enemy can put an iPhone in your hand, I think that's really great for him. And so he'll do all of these kinds of things and he does them every day. This is the kind of reality that Peter's wanting to get across to us. 
And so on the one hand, he's doing these things and he's been doing them for thousands of years. And he's really good at it. And if on the other hand, we're just unaware of it, then guess who's going to win that fight? And Peter doesn't, doesn't want that. So he wakes us up to this reality. He's saying, wake up, the devil, he's real. He's attacking you. He's looking for someone to drink down and devour. I want you to be awake to this reality. And so he gives us this kind of word picture of the enemy, like a roaring lion. And as if that wasn't bad enough, just a few verses earlier, he's given us a word picture of ourselves as sheep. He said, you're the flock of God. So if the lion wasn't alarming enough, wait, now I'm a sheep? Okay, now the point of this isn't to make us afraid. The point of it is to wake us up. Peter's saying you have to be awake in your Christian walk. I was reading an article the other week, uh, and it was about the St. Louis Zoo. And at the zoo, a bear got out of the bear enclosure. Yeah, and then it happened again. Yeah, and at that point, they thought, maybe we should rethink how this enclosure works. Um, but I was thinking, what if, we were, what if you were on a trip to the zoo? What if you were spending time at the zoo one day, maybe with family or friends, and you're at the zoo? You're, why are you at the zoo? Just to, to enjoy your day, just to have a good time. And if as you're there at the zoo, uh, an announcement comes, comes over the speaker saying, the lion has got out of its enclosure. We are attempting to locate it. <laughs> But right now, it is prowling around, seeking for someone to devour. How many of you know you're approaching that day differently from that point on? All of a sudden, it doesn't matter so much whether you enjoy the day or not. It doesn't matter so much whether the tiger was awake and you got to see him. I'm just trying to stay alive now. There's a lion prowling around. This is what Peter is saying to us. I want you to have this kind of awareness as you live your days. Sometimes we want to think that our Christian life is like a trip to the zoo, that I just get to enjoy the joy and peace of God and I walk around in serenity and these kinds of things. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm just going to let go and let God. Where is that one in the Bible? Yeah, that's not what Peter says, is it? He says, there's a lion seeking to destroy your faith. And what do I want you to do? I want you to be alert. I want you to be sober-minded that we need to wake up to what is the actual reality of our lives. This brings us to our second point. Of course, if the enemy is real, that means that we are in warfare. This is what Peter's trying to get across to us is that you, as you outwork your Christian life, you need to understand that what does it look like? It looks like warfare. It looks like, it looks like continually waging war against the works of the devil. You know, as I was preparing and I was thinking, resist the devil, I kept thinking, resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee. And then I went back to 1 Peter and it said, resist the devil. It didn't mention anything about fleeing. Yeah. So did I just, was that my own happy thought? What's going on here? That's actually in James chapter 4, verse 7. James says, resist the devil and he will flee. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah. What he's getting across there, what James is getting across is this real possibility of victory in our lives. Yep. As we come into conflict with the enemy, I want you to know that it's worth the fight because if you resist him, he will flee. You can have victory. Yes. Yes. That's not what Peter says though. Right. <laughs> That's not what Peter says. He says, resist the devil. You'll be like your brothers all around the world who are suffering. What he is emphasizing, he would agree that we can have victory, but he's not emphasizing the victory. He's emphasizing, I just want you to be ready for constant warfare. I want you to be ready and I want you to know what it's going to feel like. It's going to feel like suffering, just like your brothers all around the world. It's important that we're ready for warfare. It's important that we're ready for these things because up until this point in the letter, Peter has portrayed our faith in very uh, peaceful terms. So whether it's to the government, I want you to submit to the government. Whether it's to earthly masters that you have, I just want you to submit and obey them. If there are people persecuting you, I want you to answer kindly to them. I want you to love one another. I want you to submit to one another. I want you to submit ultimately to God. All of these kinds of things. So Peter's basic advice here is be peaceful, submit, show kindness, answer with respect. 
Obviously, in these things, he's following the teaching of Jesus, who said, do not resist the one who is evil. So in any of our human relationships, we have this kind of attitude, this kind of mindset, this kind of approach. But Peter wants to make it absolutely clear that there is one who we take the exact opposite approach to. I don't want you to make any kind of peace with the devil. And nothing is more important for our Christian lives than that we understand this. We get our heads around the fact that there is a war for us to participate in and to wage. A Christian who's not ready to fight is not likely to be successful in walking out their Christian lives. If you don't realize that your walk is also a fight, it's not necessarily going to go well. Or to put it differently, a Christian who's not ready to suffer will not win the fight. This again is what Peter says is resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced all around the world. And so if we're embracing warfare, if we're saying, okay, no, I've been called into warfare, what we're saying here is I'm also embracing suffering. That if engagement in that warfare causes some kind of pain, some kind of suffering to me, I'm counting the cost on the front end to say I'm willing to do that. It's worth it to win this warfare. My oldest son, Jed, was playing soccer uh, this year. He started soccer. And let me tell you that there is a, a unique kind of suffering that you go through as you watch seven-year-olds play soccer. <laughs> it is, I consider myself a patient person, uh, but, but just watching them <laughs> test my patience on a, a level that has never been tested before. <laughs> There was one particular game that they were playing. Um, and as, the, as they were playing, uh, an ice cream van drove past behind them. And it made it, you know, ice cream van kind of music. And all of them were just, ooh, a pretty sound. They all just turned around to, to face the ice cream van. Now, the opposing team, who, not trying to make a point here, but they were mostly girls, they just stayed focused and just scored an easy goal. And I'm just there like, whoa, okay. <laughs> Back to, my, um, back to my book on my Kindle because I cannot watch this game. Uh, anyway, where am I going here? Uh, Jed, so, so he's playing soccer and we, Jed's a Christian. He's a little Christian. And so we've taught him, we've started teaching him about kindness, about love, respect, these kind of things. There's a way that he would approach, for example, playing on the play playground where he would think, I want to take turns, I want to be respectful, all of those kind of things. And he took this general kind of approach into his soccer playing. Okay, so if the, en if the enemy team, the other team, opposing team, if the enemy has the ball, his general approach is like, uh, yeah, you go, you go, your turn, your turn, you go. Okay. I'm like, and so I'm saying to Jed week after week, listen, you have, to, you have to be aggressive. This is the only thing I want for you from the game is to be aggressive. Like all of that stuff that we've taught you about how to live, this is something different. You got to put that to the side. We need to be aggressive. Just go for their ankles. No, I didn't say that. But I want you to engage in this game, okay? And so I was saying this to him week after week and he, and he just, it wasn't really clicking. Uh, it just wasn't happening. Um, he just wasn't, wasn't approaching the game in this kind of a way. And so I keep saying it. And on one game, he decided, you know what, I'm going to get stuck in there. I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to try and make a tackle. And when he did that, uh, you know, kind of two minutes into the game, he went to tackle the ball and they collided. It was neither of their fault, but they collided and Jed just fell to the floor, kind of winded, you know. And um, it was pretty amazing because once he got up and just experienced a little bit of pain, he was like, now I'm ready to play. Now I, okay, now I understand soccer involves pain, okay? So if I can deal with a little bit of pain, now I can play the way that I'm supposed to play. Now I can contribute towards my team. Now I can win. Um, and it's the same for us, okay? We're not going to win in our Christian lives unless we realize that full engagement in it can involve some level of pain, can involve some level of suffering. And once we do that, once we settle that, all of a sudden we can engage in, a, in an entirely different way. We could go through example after example of how this actually works out, but in our wrestle against sin, this is an absolutely vital insight to get. So Hebrews 12 verses three through four say, consider him, consider Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. 
In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. And so what is the author saying here? He's saying, as you fight sin, it's going to get to the point where it feels painful. And that's where you really need to keep resisting. Okay, because all of us in a moment, we can think, I want to make this change. I want to do this differently. But a certain point is going to come where it feels really painful to make that decision. It felt exciting in the moment of, of resolve, the moment of repentance. Now I actually have to endure some suffering in order to choose righteousness. And that's something we need to decide on the front end is pursuing God, pursuing his righteousness is worth a degree of pain to me. Does this make sense? Church life is the exact same way. Uh, you know, typically when we join a new church, at first it feels wonderful, it feels great. We appreciate the worship and the teaching, the fellowship, all of these kinds of things. Uh, but at a certain point when we're plugged into a church, it will happen sooner or later that there comes to be an element of pain involved in staying committed to that congregation. There can be offense, there can be misunderstanding, there can be frustration with leadership. There can be differences in, in direction, all of these kind of things. And I believe that the word of the Lord would be, be willing to suffer for the sake of staying connected to the body of Christ. One of the main commands that the New Testament gives us about how to outwork church life together is to be patient with one another. That word patience used to be translated in kind of older English as long suffering. So what does it mean? What is God telling us to do? He's saying that in church life, I want you to suffer for a long time. How is church life going to go well? It's going to go well if you adopt the mindset of I'm willing to suffer. When things get hard, I'm not going to start to shop around. I'm not going to isolate myself. I'm going to say being plugged in is worth some level of pain if that's what it takes. Witnessing. The main reason we don't witness is because we don't want the suffering of an awkward conversation for most of us. Is that not true? And we just need to decide. Now, I take the school of worship out on a Thursday afternoon and, and we, you know, try to preach the gospel with people. And I just settle every time before we go out. This is going to suck. <laughs> so I don't like talking to strangers. <laughs> But that's fine, right? That's fine. It's just not going to be my most enjoyable afternoon. But what if someone gets born again? Yes. Sickness. It's impossible to say uh, for, for many who are sick, uh, why has that happened? Is that an attack of the enemy? Uh, I don't know. But, but one thing that I do know is that the enemy wants to rob you of worship. This is what he said to God in the, book of Job, in the book of Job, is if you allow me to make Job sick, I'll show you that he'll stop worshiping you. And so I don't know all the answers. I don't know how to, to answer all the questions, but I will say this, that if you're going through sickness, if you have physical pain in your body, uh, in your life in this season, if you worship God, if you just praise him, I want to tell you that you are waging war against the enemy. You are successfully resisting and defeating the enemy's plan in your life. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? That's really good. And we will pray that you get healed. That's right. So to resist, the devil means to, to set oneself against, to withstand, to oppose, to wage war against. It's an attitude that says, I am not going to let the enemy have his way in my life today. Which still somewhat begs the question of, okay, so how do I resist him? Let's get really practical, John. What are you actually asking me to do here? And in order to answer this, I just want to remind us of something that, that we know a little bit about the spiritual realm, because the enemy is a, a spiritual enemy. And so we've already emphasized that it's, that it's real, uh, that the enemy is real, but we also need to say that it's, it's close that the spiritual realm is invisible, so we can't see it or touch it. But that doesn't mean that it's something that's far away. It's actually right here. Um, it's, it's close. One way that I've heard it said is that the, the physical and the spiritual are almost like laid on top of each other. Okay, they're interwoven together. They, they're constantly interacting with each other. That something that happens in the physical always affects the spiritual. Something in the spiritual, again, vice versa, affects the physical. And we know this. We know this from ourselves. We know that as human beings, we are physical beings, that we have uh, a body. 
uh, that we interact with the physical world, but at the same time we understand that we're more than a body, that we have a spirit. This is one of the foundational things that we understand about ourselves and that those two things, those two sides of us, uh, constantly affect and interact with one another. Yep. Another kind of classic... Uh, illustration of this is in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. And in this story, the city of Samaria is being um, besieged by, by a foreign army. And uh, at this time, the prophet Elisha was alive and his, and his servant comes to him uh, basically in a panic. You know, there's, there's this army that's coming against us. And Elisha is completely unconcerned about it. He says, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, a spiritual army. Now, if I was the servant of Elisha, I think I would feel like, okay, that's nice. I love that there's a spiritual reality too, but how is that possibly going to help us against this very physical, real army that is coming against us? But of course, this is the teaching, this is the understanding of this story, is that the physical and the spiritual are constantly interplaying and affecting one another. This how it works in the New Testament over and over again. We could pick any number of passages, but uh, Romans 12 verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. And so what Paul is saying is, in light of all the mercy that you've received, the grace, I want you to do something with your body. I want you to take this and live for God, that there's a very physical expression to how a worship to God looks. But then he says, this is your spiritual worship. That as you do this physical thing, it's actually a spiritual reality that's taking place too. We need to understand this. We need to understand that these things uh, relate together because otherwise this passage could be quite confusing. Like Peter just brought up the devil, said that he's like a lion, told you to resist him, and then said nothing else. <laughs> You're like, wait, you, you can't just bring up this topic without giving me some more help here. What does it actually mean? Don't you want to give me a step-by-step -step guide now for spiritual warfare, for deliverance ministry, these kind of things? But Peter, of course, because he knows the reality and the, these two things are so connected, what he's saying is, no, 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 just do all of the things that I've told you all along in my letter. In other words, to resist the devil isn't so much a new command that he's giving. It's just a new perspective on all of the things that he's been telling us to do all along. It's like live out your whole Christian life to God with diligence. I was thinking of calling my message, how to defeat the devil in three easy steps. Because <laughs> that's what we want. That's not what Peter is saying. He's saying every day, Live your life to God with sober-mindedness and diligence. That's, that's his answer for us. This reminds me of Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 12. He says, When an unclean spirit has gone out from a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, if it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order, it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. And so what is Jesus saying here is the exact same thing. Even if you have kind of an outstanding spiritual encounter of, of deliverance or resisting and seeing him flee. Um, what he's saying is that's going to do you no good unless you go on to do some very simple, practical, consistent things in your life. You need to get your house in order now. Otherwise, your, your last condition is going to be worse than the first. And so what does resist the devil mean? It means that we, that we pray. It means that we devote ourselves to the word of God. It means that we do a lot of practical things. I was thinking, you know, if, if someone came to me and said that they were struggling with uh, anxiety, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been struggling with this, I feel like it's gripping me, it's a daily thing, uh, I would, we would talk, and I'm sure we would talk about lots of things. We would try to unpack, okay, what's going on here? But, but one thing that I would inevitably ask them is about their caffeine intake, because that just affects things, right? That's, that matters. That's going to be a factor in what's going on. 
Now, if they came back to me and said, no, listen, I don't think you understand what it, the fact that you brought up caffeine under, makes me understand that you don't know what I'm saying. Because I think this is a spiritual attack. I think the, the enemy is attacking me with anxiety. I think this is a, a spiritual thing. And what I would answer back is, you clearly don't understand the spiritual realm, all right? If it was just general anxiety, then giving up caffeine was just some advice that I have for you. But if the enemy's attacking you, then you must give up caffeine. That's playing into his hands all along. And these physical things always affect the spiritual. I'm not trying to attack caffeine here. I'm just, uh, I'm simply saying that what we watch, what we eat, what we drink, the practical decisions that we make in our lives all contribute towards, are you resisting the devil? Like what, okay, so what would resisting the devil look like for you? In fact, let's just close our eyes for a minute. What is one thing that you could do this week that you know that God's been speaking to you about? It could be, any, it could be anything, something big, something small, a one-time thing, a consistent thing. What we're saying is that is resisting the devil. Let's be sober-minded. Let's wake up and let's do it. So what does resist the devil mean? It means lots of things. <laughs> but just to briefly uh, tie in the, the, the other things that, that Peter says in this passage, uh, he starts in, in verses one through four by uh, exhorting leaders, by talking to leaders. And it's absolutely essential because the enemy knows that if he can get two leaders, he's going to much more easily take down the flock. So this is a call to elders. This is a call to home group leaders. This is a call to fathers. This is a call to wherever you lead in your life. What Peter is saying here is lead. Do it wholeheartedly. Do it even if it's suffering. Knowing that you'll be repaid for all the suffering in the next life. But, but don't give up, don't shrink back from it. We desperately need leaders to lead. Verse five, he starts to talk about uh, church life. Verse five says, I could read it from my Bible. Verse five says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So what does resisting the enemy look, look like? It looks like forgiving those who you're with, walking in humility towards them and being plugged into the body. And Peter says there's a special grace for you that comes from God when you're out working humility in the body of Christ. Isn't that good news? So let's be plugged into the body. Verse six, Peter continues to talk about humility, but now he directs it towards God. He says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. That other resist the enemy verse that we referenced earlier in James also connects these two things. Resist the devil, how do you do that? Submit to God. So again, what we're saying here is just we are living out our Christian lives. Is there anything to repent of? Is there anything to confess? Is there anything you need to turn around on? Is there any way that you need to adjust to the Lordship of Christ? Then he talks about anxieties, not being cast down by anxieties. Cast all your anxieties onto him because he cares for you. What Peter's saying here simply is that there's this thing called prayer. <laughs> if you're anxious, if you're cast down, you can just go to God. Cultivate this lifestyle of prayer. He's going to take your burdens. He's going to help you walk. So how do you resist the devil? Christianity 101. <laughs> go to God and pray. He's going to help you. He's going to come to you. And so it means do all of these things. Do all of the things that he's already said in the letter. Do these things, but do them sober-minded. Do them aware. Do them encouraged, knowing that you are effectively resisting the devil in your life. And so final thing to say here is that, yes, Peter tells us to resist the devil. He doesn't say that God will resist the devil for you. He says, you, I want you to resist the devil. But that is not his final word. So in verses 10 and 11, he says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace 
who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> I know. So what is the balance? It's you fight, but as you do it, guess what? God is going to come alongside of you. It's not going to feel like you fighting on your own. It's going to feel like God Almighty coming along and strengthening, establishing, confirming you. Oh, and by the way, he has all power and dominion. This is good news. This is good news. So let's pray together. Thank you, God. God, we thank you for your amazing word to us. Thank you for the help that you are giving us this morning in, in bringing your word to us. Thank you for your promise that you yourself come alongside of us. You strengthen us. When I feel completely weak, God is my strength. When I feel completely dark, God is my light. God, you're a river that never runs dry. So God, help us, help us to be sober-minded, help us to be aware, help us to resist the devil in our lives and help us to do it all, knowing that you come close to us and help your people. We love you, God. We love you. Amen. Amen. Great job, guys.